I'd like to talk about the, the liveliness of uh, plants and uh, botanical life in the past. Uh, and what I'm hoping to do is show how plants are active beings in their own right, entangled in the lives of humans and non-humans, and capable to and actively involved in transforming and changing the world around them. Now, uh, as an archaeologist that specialises in the study of, of plant life in the past, I think that plants are absolutely amazing. They're a form of life that is so active, so animate, so lively, but also so completely different to ourselves. They can continue to sort of astound me. I'm really blown away just that every day sort of learning new things about just how amazing they are. So it's always something of a, of a disappointment to find out that this view isn't shared by other people. And I must admit that I feel this disappointment quite regularly when I read archaeological accounts of uh, European early prehistory. Um, as, as Marika van der Veen argued a few years ago, as archaeologists, we tend to view plants as, as passive objects acted upon by humans. We see them as things that humans cut down, gather, harvest, eat, burn, turn into things, rather than as living beings in their own right with the ability to act on the world. Very much the same as Nick was talking about, about animals. Um, and this sense of, of, sort of the, the passive nature of, of plants, I think, is exacerbated by the fact that we tend to homogenise plant life when we talk about it archaeologically. We, we rarely talk about specific types of plants unless it's one of a narrow range of economically important species. And I think we can see all the, sort of, like, the, the, the richness, the, the variability, the diversity of the very nature of botanical life through the terms we use, like environment, wetland, forest, as if one plant was just pretty much the same as, as, as every other. And, and I must admit that I am just as guilty of doing this as, as everyone else. And this isn't an issue that's unique to archaeology. It, it's a feature of, of Western thought. It, it's something that yeah, we, we grow up with in, in, in our cultures. And it's pervaded many other, other disciplines. But outside of archaeology, there's been a lot more work to address this, this particular issue of, of plant liveliness and the nature of plant life. And this is particularly the case in geography, where, ooh, marvelous, in, where over the past couple of decades, people have been looking at how plants have the abilities to so act upon and with the world through their own particular botanical properties. So this can be the ways that individual and specific species propagate and grow, their regenerative cycles, their abilities to sense and communicate, communicate and, and the ways in which they move, just, just, just to just give a few examples. And in other words, from this perspective, um, and with the, certainly within the geography literature, we can see plants as having the very own form of planty botanical agency. And this allows plants to become entangled in human and non-human lives, to affect change, to transform, disrupt, and manipulate the world around them. So I'd like to take this idea of plant agency as a product of the botanical properties of the plants themselves and use it to think about the nature of plant life in the British Mesolithic. And to do this, too many things. <laughs> to do this, I'm going to focus on the landscape around the Paleo Lake Flixton in the north of England. Now, during the Mesolithic, uh, this is a major focus of human activity. We have the, the site of Star Car, which is over on the... Is it working? It's over on the western side of the lake, anyway. Um, uh, it, it's a very large early Mesolithic settlement. It's, it's, it's occupied for a lot, long periods of time. It's very extensive. And there are 25 other sort of sites occupied intermittently throughout the Mesolithic, many of which are contemporary with each other. So it's, it's a very sort of... Um, dynamic area of, of, hu of the human past, but it also has a very rich and dynamic botanical history. And I want to draw out the histories and the lives of two particular plants present within this landscape during the time that humans are there in the Mesolithic. And I'm going to start with the lives of willow trees at Star Car. Um, now, willow is present in the landscape several centuries prior to the Mesolithic, and by the start of the period, it's a fairly small component of a woodland that's dominated by birch, with smaller quantities of aspen and probably some pine. And its growth and development within the landscapes 
comes about through its interactions with the world around it. Um, this includes its interactions with other trees as willow competes for light and space, its interactions with soils, nutrients, weather events, climates, and the relationships it forms with different animal species. And these ongoing interactions, these relationships that it's forming with the world around it, so sort of it structures its distribution across the landscape, the communities it forms with other plants, its morphology, growth structure of individual trees. And these interactions brought Willow to Star Car, where it started interacting with, and you've guessed it, beavers. Popular, I hope they've paid to come to tag. Uh, so Willows arrive at Star Car through their own agency, beavers through their agency begin feeding on willow and in doing so they're felling willow trees the trees are they're, they're, they're causing them to fall and willow in many cases is responding by producing coppice that's the long straight stems grow very quickly and they help the tree to recover from the damage it's just sustained these interactions also have a great effect on the surrounding environment as well it, it created a greater degree of openness within the, the woodland at the site um, and it resulted in a lot of ground disturbance that other plants through their own particular botanical nature were able to move into. So it creates a, a highly diverse ground flora. So the interactions between willow and beaver, interactions which are contingent on the botanical agency of willow, um, shapes this environment prior to and independently of the actions of humans. And when humans arrive, they quickly become bound up in the agency of willow and its history of interactions with beavers and other elements of the world. So humans preferentially harvest the willow coppice and acts that's informed by the morphology and growth patterns of the willow itself. They, they selected stems of particular diameter, choices which are structured by the history of willow beaver interactions. And willow responds to this by producing fresh growth, again in the form of coppice, which then grows over a period of five to 10 years before it's harvested. And so again, willow is now structuring the temporality or the rhythms of willow harvesting by humans. So humans are entangled in, in the prior history of willow and its growth cycles, which structure the decisions they make regarding which stands to harvest and which they could return to and when they can return to. And willow in turn is bound up in the agency of humans. Humans are preventing coppice from maturing by regularly, regularly harvesting it. This maintains young stands of, 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 of quite young coppice, and that in turn maintains the open character of the woodland. Now, humans are clearly aware of this agency, that they're observing it directly, they're, they're interacting with it, it it's vital, it, it, it's contingent on uh, or for the, the, um, the harvesting of coppice. And through this, they also come to understand the particular nature of willow and its differences to other non-human life. And I'd argue that this is reflected in the way that people treated and deposited objects made from and deriving from willow and other non-humans. There we go, I missed a slide. Um, so yeah, so, so one of the features of the Stark Art is, is the, the deliberate intentional deposition and treatment of certain materials. And it, it's very selective in terms of, of, of which non-humans they come from. And it's particularly clear with the treatment of composite objects like projectiles that had separate components made from willow, so that the shaft of the projectile, and red deer antler, which is used to make the projectile point. These are being disassembled at the site, and the two parts made of different materials are being treated differently. The, the parts made of red deer antler are deposited into shallow water at the edge of the site, into the lake itself, and the willow components are taken away and treated differently. And it's interesting to think that this treatment not only acknowledges the nature of red deer and willow as living beings, but also the intrinsic differences between them. And as I say that, I'm also thinking about the bizarre similarities between antler and willow coppice, both regenerating, but that's a that next year's tag, I suppose. So, so willow, willow then is active in the, in the early Mesolithic world. It's, it's bound up in relations with non-humans, including beavers. It's playing an active role in shaping local plant communities, and it's entangled in human lives, informing the timing and nature of particular activities, whilst also being affected by these actions. I witted a bit, so I'm going to be a bit quicker for the next bit. So the other species I want to talk about is, is hazel. So towards the end of this period of uh, willow human interaction at Star Car, we see the arrival of hazel, a new species appearing in the landscape. 
Its initial expansion into, into Northern Europe in general is probably caused by climatic changes, but it's able to expand into this existing birch, willow, aspen, pine forest through its own particular properties. It's fast growing, it's tolerant of shade, it creates quite dense leaf litter. Um, anything else? No, no, it creates, uh, it creates quite dense leaf litter in the, in the ground around it. This allows it in the first instance to enter forests because it has this tolerance to shade and then to suppress the growth of trees around it. So it prevents pine seedlings from growing because of the leaf litter. It casts shade over birch saplings, which present it from prevent it from maturing. It also creates relationships with certain animals, which helps it propagate and move into new areas. It produces hard shelled nuts, which are an important food for things like squirrels. Uh, and the squirrels then, and other rodents, cache these nuts away from where the trees are growing. They leave some of them, these germinate and grow into trees. And through these various aspects of its own botanical nature, hazel quickly starts to form small stands within the existing woodland around the lake. And some of these botanical properties also allow it to become entangled in the lives of humans. It provides a source of a new source of food in the form of hazelnuts, and it coppices very easily, making it a good source of material. And this leads to changes in human diet, technology, social relations, and the way humans interacted with non-humans. So you know, as a new source of food, it necessitates new forms of, of technology and technical practice, some of which might be adapted from uh, uh, existing forms of practice, some which have, might have been new. People develop ways of storing it. It changes the nature of food, it has new flavours, smells, food combinations. Harvesting hazelnuts changes patterns of human activity in the landscape, taking people maybe to new places at different times or maybe to, um, to, to, to known places but at different times of the year. It might have disrupted exist, like, you know, and changing existing rhythms of human lives. You know, it would have had to have been placed into existing sort of scheduling of economic practices. Um, one sec, all right. Um, you know, it, it might have also bound up sort of unchanged social relations. You can imagine conversations around issues of who harvests this new food, who, who processes it, who eats it. Yeah, is it an exotic only, only eaten by certain people at certain times? It also changes people's relationships with, or human relationships with other non-humans. Squirrels, unlikely to have been much of a competitor to humans prior to the arrival of hazel, suddenly humans are having to deal with, with the issue that squirrels are also eating hazelnuts. It changes people's relationships with willow. We know from other sites uh, in other parts of Europe that once hazel arrives, it quickly replaces willow as one of the main forms of material that people are, are, are using. And we also, around uh, Lake Flixton, around this time, just after Hazel comes established, we start seeing evidence of people clearing existing areas of, of willow around the lake, which are then um, rapidly colonised by, by Hazel itself. It's also worth thinking about how this new plant might have been perceived by humans. You know, if humans are acknowledging the agency of willow, what happens when a new species arrives? Is there an initial sense of like ontological unease as people begin to interact with a new living thing? There might be questions about how do you properly interact with it, appropriate ways of depositing material from it. Was there a period of time where people experimented with different ways of interacting with the tree through processes of deposition, for example, waiting to see then what happened in order to work out how to integrate hazel into existing sort of ontological systems. So, so like willow, hazel becomes established in the environment, entangled in the lives of humans and non-humans through its own botanical agency, and in doing so transforms aspects of human life and the relationship between humans and other non-humans. So in both these cases, I think we can argue that humans aren't simply harvesting food and materials from an inanimate planty thing, they're actively engaging with living beings who are, bound, who are themselves bound up in ongoing relationships with a host of other non-humans. Beings that have the capacity to inform human decision making, change economic practices, transform social relationships, changing existing understandings of the world itself. And plants are teaching humans about the nature of plant life um, and the ways in which they play active roles in sort of maintaining and changing environments. And they do so in their own specific ways 
due to their own particular botanical character and their own unique stories. And maybe we should be thinking this about this, right, writing a bit, bit differently when, when we start thinking about our narratives of plants in the past. To, to, sort, of, to sort of paraphrase Tim Ingold a bit, should we think about willowing and, and hazeling to encapsulate the character of particular species? Though I do agree with what Nick was saying earlier about the problematic nature of dealing with species, because what's interesting about willow is people don't just interact with willow, they interact with specific individual trees with their own particular history. And as that takes me to 15 minutes, I will stop there. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for the session organised.